Welcome to the Wander Learn Podcast. I'm your host, Franz Tapon. In this episode, I interview the CEO of Pay With Moon. It's a really cool, non custodial way to create virtual disposable credit cards. And today is the day that they have just announced a partnership with Apple Pay and Google Pay so that you can actually use this with them. It's a very cool way to privately purchase goods and services in the United States. And so I and highly encourage people to check it out, especially if you value your privacy and you want to be able to make purchases in a private fashion, or if you want a way to spend your Bitcoin. This is really, really interesting and fascinating. It uses what's called a lightning network, which is Bitcoin's way to facilitate small micropayments things that are worth only pennies or as much as a few several hundred dollars and probably one day it will reach the thousands of dollars this episode is sponsored by my patrons at patreon.com slash ftapon thank you so much for your guys' support and now let's dive right into the conversation with ken kruger nobody knows probably or very few people know unless you're completely geeky and you're look for this podcast in this video they've never heard of pay with moon so tell us briefly what it's about and what problem does it solve? Yeah, so what our platform allows users to do is create a virtual Visa card. You can then load that card with crypto that then you can spend anywhere Visa is accepted in the United States. When you say crypto, can you be specific? Primarily focusing on Bitcoin. There's the uh, We support payments via the Bitcoin Lightning Network. And we also have an integration with Coinbase so you can spend uh, Bitcoin, Litecoin, Ether, and Bitcoin Cash. Cello and Zcash via uh, your Coinbase account. Okay, great. Cello now Cello has Cello dollars and Cello itself. Uh, which version of Cello? Yes. So right now it's the Cello governance token itself. Uh, Coinbase hasn't added their stable coin yet. So okay. um, so right now we're only using the 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 Cello token itself. Excellent. Okay. So so somebody who's got Cello do, uh, Cello not the stable coin. Sorry, just Cello or mm -hmm. or, or Zcash. Mm -hmm. Or Bitcoin, but not Ethereum. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we do support Ethereum on Coinbase. Oh, I, okay. I'm sorry. Uh, and and then they have this, and they want to buy something online. Mm -hmm. Then mm -hmm. they create basically a disposable credit card. Is that fair to say? Yeah, pretty much. Mm -hmm. And so it's a it's a one use credit card. So you load it up. Let's explain how the process works. Yeah, so uh, the cards can either be used one time or you can load a maximum of $1,000 onto a card. You can spend it multiple times if you'd like. Uh, but the vast majority of people use one card per purchase. Uh, so you can just type in the exact amount that you want that card for. Say, you know, you're shopping on Amazon and the purchase is, you know, $57.99. You can just type in $57.99. It's going to prompt you uh, if you're paying, for example, with Lightning Network, it'll say, hey, Here's your QR code of your Lightning invoice. You scan that, and it sends the Bitcoin over. If it's Coinbase, it'll just pull the funds from, from your Coinbase account. Okay. And boom, you have a card and about a second later. Okay, and then the obvious question for anybody watching this is to say, why should I care? I mean, my Visa card works great. Why do I care about this? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I mean, this is really for people who, you know, they have crypto that they want to spend, right? Uh, and there's a few nuances here that we really target for the, the crypto community. One is the privacy angle. Uh, we don't require any KYC information. We just ask for a name, email address, and password to create an account. So it's very private. It's pretty much the most private way to spend Bitcoin on the internet right now. Uh, it's also non-custodial. So most crypto spending methods, you have to deposit your funds before you, know, you can swipe your card and then it deducts from that uh, custodial account. Uh, we don't we don't do that, um, and we also have the uh, time of exchange is different. So a lot of times, you know, you deposit your crypto to an account, you swipe your you know crypto debit card, and the exchange happens the moment of swipe. With us, the exchange happens the moment you load the card. Uh, so that way, say the price of Bitcoin shoots up, you may want to lock in that exchange rate as opposed to say you're going out at a restaurant and you're paying for dinner. You have no idea what the exchange rate is at that point in time. Um, it may not be that good. So okay. that's where we're, we're different as opposed to some of the other options. And, and tell us a little bit about, you said that some, most people just use the card for the exact amount of the purchase that you're trying to buy. But you said some mm -hmm. people don't. So explain that. Like, let's say I put a thousand dollars on a card and I only want to spend 50 mm -hmm. bucks, or let me just say $100, so I have $900 in change. Mm -hmm. How does it work, the change? 
Do I have to ask for a yeah, refund? So the cards, yeah, so right now the cards last two months. So if you have $1,000 on a card, you spend 100 bucks. you have that $900 left over on the card. You could spend that at any point over the next two months, right? Uh, if at the end you, you're like, you know, I don't want to use this card anymore, you could delete the card, and that automatically submits a refund request, and we'll refund you any unspent amount left on the card when you're done with it. Okay, okay. So that's what some people decide to do. Mm-hmm. Because may- maybe they just don't want to be sending these little micro sends and, and these constant, you know, like every single time I want to buy something online, if I'm buying, let's say, mm-hmm. uh, one thing every three days, maybe I just want to buy mm-hmm. a card for the month and then just mm-hmm. continually de- reuse and reuse that card if I want to. That is possible. E- exactly. Or say, for example, the price of Bitcoin shoots up, right? And you want to lock in that exchange rate. Right, so you could create a couple one thousand dollar cards, and mm-hmm. uh, and now you've locked that in, and we're giving you a free exchange from Bitcoin to dollars. So uh, you know, it's a hard, hard, hard thing to pass up, right? Yeah, um, that's actually a great then, point. I hadn't even thought about that. That it is a good way to kind of quote unquote sell Bitcoin, even though in some ways you're not. Well, I guess you are selling it in a certain way. Yeah, and it mm-hmm. brings up the issue like the IRS, for example, in the United States, they see mm-hmm. Bitcoin as property, and so then you know when you sell your how, how do you have to deal with that issue? Is, it, is that a headache? Yeah. So, yeah. So we don't have to deal much with that. We're not an exchange. We don't have to issue 1099s. Uh, you know, uh, really, the tax burden falls on our customers, depending on you know their their geographic region and what laws they're subject to. So, anytime you use Bitcoin to buy something, and legally within Moon, uh, the customer is buying a Moon card, so it's it's taxed as a purchase. But that is a taxable event that you have to factor into your capital gains or capital loss calculation. So, uh, you know, we can't do that for you. All we could do is say, hey, here's your transaction history. And you have to, you know, plug that into your favorite tax prep software and, um, and, and use that to calculate. We don't know the tax basis for those coins in the first place. Got it. Of course, that makes sense. And so I'll just tell you, uh, for those listening, the experience I had, it was my first time with Pay With Moon. I want to buy a computer screen and it was not on amazon it was on some uh random website and it was a hundred and i think twelve dollars or something like that 115 dollars so i created the card I, tra- I sent the through a lightning payment bought it and it worked perfectly and one of the things i really liked about it is the fact that it, even though it's my email address i put her name on the card i sent the money and then that way because her name matches and you can put any address you want for the shipping address and the billing address and I put her address as the shipping and billing address, and it, the name on the card is her name. The merchant thought it was her who was buying this thing, uh, this monitor screen, even though actually it was me. And I was just thinking that this could be a really great way to send a gift to somebody. For example, Ken, mm-hmm. if I want to send you a birthday present, uh, and I don't want to send it to your address, my mm-hmm. name, and then care of Ken, I could just put it straight to your address, and it will arrive to your door. Is that these are all possibilities, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, there are a lot of really interesting use cases like that. You know, users every day are messaging us and saying, hey, here's here's how, you know, a new use case that I found. We have people using it at, at point of sale with merchants. Uh, so merchants oh, really? can accept Bitcoin and, yeah, they'll they'll have the customer effectively buy the cards and then they'll run it through their, their uh, payment terminal later. Uh, there's like, all these interesting use cases people are coming up with. So let's say I'm at a grocery store, for example, and I've got $100 worth of groceries uh, and I want to pay for it with Moon. So how would I do that? Yeah, so so what would happen is uh, there, there's a few ways of doing that, right? So if you as the consumer wanted to make that purchase, um, you know, you could, you could bring up Moon on your phone, create a virtual card. And uh, in some cases, you know, if they know what they're doing, they'll be able to manually input that card information at the point of sale. Um, you are actually working on Apple Pay and Google Pay integration, so it'll be much simpler. But what's interesting is that we've seen merchants actually using it, where they'll say, okay, um, you know, they'll put, bring up Moon on a tablet, have the customer scan the QR code so they're paying for the card. And at the end of the day, the merchant just has all these Moon cards that they just run through their um, their normal payment processor, so they're capturing those funds after the fact, and they never had to do any integration, and it just kind of goes through the rest of their uh, payment system just like normal. 
Yeah, it's just like really interesting to see all these different use cases. They're not even necessarily convenient, but uh, but it's funny to just see see how people are using it. Right, and so the main convenience is that you have to find a cashier who's going to actually put in the, the card numbers and, and the expiration date as well as the three-digit code on the back, right? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Tell us a little bit about your integration with Google Pay. But it should be real simple where you can just load it in uh, you either, you know, you'll, you'll just how you normally load a card to Apple Pay or Google Pay. You can either scan it um, by, you know, kind of holding the phone up to your computer screen, or you could type in the details manually. You'll, you'll have the card in Apple Pay, Google Pay. So any payment terminal that, you know, accepts NFC payments with Apple Pay or Google Pay, you'll just be able to pay with your Moon card. That's brilliant. And you will have to do the Lightning payment in order to fund the card if it's not already funded before, obviously, correct? Mm-hmm. Exactly. Mm-hmm. Right. So it, it works really well if you've already had a funded card, because otherwise you have to uh, wait around for the lightning payment to come through, which often is not that long. But mm-hmm. if it's sure. a big purchase, mm-hmm. it may not go through yeah. very easily. What have you learned about the capacity of the lightning network to handle payments? For example, mm-hmm. the the fees that start to get tacked on once you start spending $50, yeah. $100, $1,000, mm-hmm. well, I guess thousands is the max. But sure. Mm-hmm. I, I'm sure there's like a curve <laughs> that when when fees mm-hmm. start to get heavy or, sure. or at least transactions mm-hmm. start to get slow, what has your experience been? Right. There is a correlation to the amount being sent, but it's more about the connectivity, right? If we're trying, if someone's trying to pay us or we're trying to pay somebody and, you know, they, you have to go through, you know, seven hops, right? In order to reach your destination, that's where the fees can really add up, Right. Um, or if you have a node that's down or you have a channel that's currently disabled, right? It has to circumvent that and then it's making more hops and every hop is an opportunity for a node to charge some, some fee on top of that, right? So we've seen it add up, but it generally it's no more than a couple cents. So, um, so it's been, it's been very reasonable. It also depends what wallet the customers are using, right? Some wallets, the way they're structured, it forces uh, the funds to go through a specific node. So uh, Moon, M-U-U-N, wallet is like that. I believe Phoenix is like that, where they run a central node. And uh, this way, all of their wallets of their customers are, uh, you know, it's completely non-custodial, but it has to go through that centralized node. And sometimes that node will charge a little extra fees. Uh, the Moon wallet does uh, some, some on-chain stuff sometimes, so the fees can add up. But but generally, it's much, much less expensive than doing an on-chain transaction. So. Right. And make sure that people understand when you say moon that you're talking about the M-U-U-N. Sorry, or double N or is it W? W, W. Okay, U-U. Mm-hmm. Uh, so M-U-U-N, mm-hmm. that wallet as opposed to mm-hmm. your wallet or or mm-hmm. or solution, which is moon as in the plant mm-hmm. and not the, whatever, the, the thing that goes around Earth. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. So... Or the price of Bitcoin someday in the future, one hopes. Um, yeah. <laughs> um, so what about, now, Coinbase has a, a many, many, many cryptocurrencies. Why have you only grabbed a handful? Mm-hmm. Yeah. So the we originally went with the top four uh, when, you know, we, when we started the company, which is Bitcoin, Litecoin, Ether, and Bitcoin Cash. Obviously, those are not necessarily the top four anymore. Um, but those are, um, you know, some of the more familiar, familiar ones that people do spend. Um, the Celo and Zcash ones we added cause we're partnered with Celo, we're partnered with Zcash. Uh, so, so we added those and, and our plan, we're going to be adding on chain payments in the future. So we'll be supporting, you know, Bitcoin, Litecoin, Ether, Zcash, Celo, uh, the, you know, obviously all the stable coins, things like that. Uh, we're going to be adding more. Uh, in terms of, you know, the, the Coinbase support and things like that. Um, it's just, uh, it adds complexity, right? And uh, we didn't want to ha- have that paradox of choice when, when you get to your checkout screen, you have 37 different currencies. So, um, you know, and the vast majority of people just spend Bitcoin anyways. Right. Now, one of the big elephants in the room that everybody probably is wondering about is how do you guys make money? And so you, mm-hmm. can you explain a little bit about that? Because I don't think you add mm-hmm. on any particular fees on top of the standard mining fees that Bitcoin mm-hmm. miners take, which of course you don't get any of that. And then, you mm-hmm. know, on the lightning network, they'll charge you a few sats, 
but you're not going to get any of that either. So that's mm. not going to you. So effectively, there's zero additional fees to fund your yeah. Moon wallet. So how do you guys actually mm -hmm. make money? Yeah, great question. So yeah, the, our users never pay anything. That's our goal. No fees for the customer. You're getting your card is not costing you any fees. You're getting a conversion from crypto to dollars that we're not charging any fees. So where we make money is when you use a card at a merchant, uh, the merchant has to pay a fee to accept that card over the Visa network. And we get a portion of that fee. Okay, so, so this is how if I'm a merchant, let's say I have a little you mm -hmm. know boutique somewhere. How, how mm -hmm. much do I have to pay Moon in order to accept mm -hmm. your card? So really, the, the merchant is not paying us directly, right? Like they're just paying their existing payment processor. So generally, if you're a merchant, you're going to pay somewhere between 2 and 3% for every card purchase that a customer makes, right? And then that fee gets split up between, a, you know, maybe like 20 different parties. Um, and, and we're one of them. Um, so uh, fortunately, we get, we get probably the largest portion of that fee. Uh, which is which is pretty nice, but that way we're able to operate our service without having to charge the customer anything, right? Right. Uh, so that works out really well. And there, longer term, there are other ways to monetize. Um, you know, even you know, we're running a Lightning Network node. We run one of the one of the largest nodes on the network. You know, and we you know right now we're not optimizing fees in order to you know make money off our node, but eventually that's something that we'll be able to do as the Lightning Network scales up. We'll be you know a major player in Lightning infrastructure. Got it. And by the way, what wallet do you recommend for Lightning? I, for example, use Blue Wallet. I don't mm -hmm. know if that sucks or is it good, mm -hmm. but it, it seems to work for me. But maybe it's mm -hmm. also doing a kind of a centralized a mining node that it's forcing my payments to go through for all I know. Mm -hmm. Sure. Yeah. So I, I also use moon, uh, sorry, blue wall. Um, that hey, I found just to be very simple. Like. Great. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. There you go. <laughs> it was the first one I set up years ago and I just kind of stuck with it. I played around with a lot of others and really, I think it depends on what your use case is. Right. And it depends like what type of phone you have and, and things like that. So the Phoenix wallet, I believe is only on Android. Uh, and they, they have a pretty slick solution. You know, Breeze is a great wallet, but uh, you have to have the app open in order to accept a payment, right? Which in some circumstances that could be annoying. And then, uh, you know, like I said, Moon Wallet, M-U-U-N, their fees are a little bit higher when you're sending a payment. There's the Zebby D wallet, which is great if you're playing games and, and you can earn Bitcoin playing Counter-Strike. That's a lot of fun. But, you know, if you're in New York, for example, you can't, you're not allowed to use their wallet because they don't have a bit license. So there's all these pros and cons of different based on your geography, the type of phone and, and what you're trying to optimize for. But for me, Blue Wallet has just always kind of, you know, been, been my default option. I wonder in a hyper Bitcoinized world in this fantasy land that a lot of Bitcoiners dream about, which is a place where Bitcoin is the de facto method of payment or, you know, through the Lightning Network, of course for small purchases that let's say in a current case, would the fees that a merchant use get eventually much lower? In other words, would, or would the whole Bitcoin network go on a different system as opposed, because right now it sounds like you're riding on the coattails or the infrastructure of the legacy financial system when it comes to doing visa card payments and debit card payments it sounds like you're running just basically on those rails now in the far distant future maybe you could bypass that and create your own network where you don't need that and it just goes straight and the merchant let's say wants to get paid directly with bitcoin or with sats sure yeah so i mean that's the thing right there's a lot of benefits to merchants accepting the bitcoin directly Right. Because in order to accept Bitcoin, you don't have to pay anything. Right. You you just get your Bitcoin. That's it. So merchants are going to save that two to three percent on their card payments if they if they go down that option. Uh, the problem is right now, in order to do that, it, it's it's a big lift. Right. Uh, E-commerce merchants, generally, they don't want to modify their checkout page. That's like their holy grail. It's heavily optimized. Amazon spent billions of dollars making sure that that checkout page converts the maximum amount of users and modifying it's a huge deal, right? Uh, and generally, if a merchant starts accepting Bitcoin, it ends up being about 1% to 2% of their total 
purchase volume. So the, the benefit is very, very negligible. So the way I've always thought about it is that in order to get merchants to accept Bitcoin directly, you need a solution like Moon that allows consumers to spend Bitcoin, to build up that customer demand to spend before the merchants will start accepting it directly. So, um, now, so that one day they'll mm-hmm. they'll realize, oh my God, I'm getting, I don't know, 10% or 20% of my revenue from these Moon guys who are all paying me in Bitcoin mm-hmm. and I'm leaving money on the table because I'm paying these 2 3% fees. And if I just mm-hmm. opened up a separate account to accept Bitcoin, mm-hmm. then mm-hmm. Uh, and then basically get paid in native Bitcoin or, or lightning payments, mm-hmm. then I can uh, keep that. I mean, isn't that yeah, basically they, what they'd you're saying? Save, yeah, they'd be able to save a lot of money if they did that. Now, the other aspect here to consider is that, you know, Visa, MasterCard, all the major payment networks are going deep into crypto. And there's, I think they see the writing on the wall and they say, hey, we need to be the companies that facilitate all of this. Because especially if you're looking at point of sale, brick and mortar locations, right? You know, if you want to get every single brick and mortar location set up to accept crypto, that is what, what a pain. You know, e-commerce is one thing that's probably easier, but brick and mortar, good luck, right? How, how do you get that set up? What about all the currencies? What about this? What about that? Um, Visa's already plugged into all of them. So they are kind of naturally the, the player that could help facilitate that. And the way they're looking at it is saying, okay, if you want to send a uh, on-chain Bitcoin transaction or any other, you know, stable coin, whatever you have, um, it's going to cost the sender money. As opposed to right now, if you swipe a credit card, you're going to earn points, right? So our consumer is going to change their behavior where they're going to spend money to, they're going to pay fees to spend their own money. Or are they still going to prefer a, a an off-chain Visa network where they can still earn money, get credit, and things like that, right? Like it's still, I think it's still to be seen what happens there. But a lot of the legacy systems are now saying, how, how can we integrate Bitcoin, crypto, stable coins to our existing systems and kind of beat them to the punch, right? What's that hybrid system look like? And I know from our end as a company, we're saying, you know, we think for the next five to 10 years, the cards aren't going to go anywhere. Uh, I think you'll see more merchants accept crypto directly, but uh, consumers may still prefer their cards because, you know, I know for one, I get 5% back on this and 3% back on that. I don't want to necessarily give up those rewards. Right. And that's the, that's the key question. I wonder what percentage of United States citizens who pay by credit card get something either cash back or points or whatever Mm -hmm. do you have any clue on that is it about 70 percent of credit cards are getting some sort of kickback if you will yeah so i I believe it's like 60 percent of the u.s population has a credit card and i mean they pretty much all give back some kind of reward these days so I, i would assume around 60% of the population. So I think it'd be hard for to, to get people off that system. I think the first thing you're going to do is you're going to get people on debit cards. They're not earning anything necessarily. Um, and, and those debit cards, uh, you know, paying with crypto, it, it could be very similar, especially if it's Lightning Network where you're going to pay, you know, half of a cent, right? No one's thinking about half a cent as, as anything significant. What about beyond that, a physical card, for example? that will yeah. make these kind of in-store point of sale transactions less onerous. We have the ability to do physical cards we wanted to. Uh it's just we haven't seen that much demand for it just yet. What's the trade-off? So I I imagine in the future. So the trade-off is, you know, when we're doing a physical card, you know, there's a cost to to mail that card out, right? Uh we have to print it, we have to mail, it, it takes time to get there. And really what we're doing as a company is saying, well what a customer is asking for. And not many people are asking for a physical card. Really, everybody loves the virtual cards. They get much more excited about Apple Pay and Google Pay than they do about having a physical card uh, sent to their house. And right now, because our cards are non-reloadable and offer that that privacy and no KYC, you know, people just want to keep it virtual. They don't want to get a physical card. Um, you know, because if you get a physical card, generally you expect it to be reloadable. It's one card you use over and over again. Uh, that would require KYC by law. So it's a, it's a different value proposition. It would end up looking very similar to some of the other products that are on the market. Got it. Understood. So when people want to pay at the pump, for example, when you're filling up your gasoline, 
mm-hmm. you're mm-hmm. it's hard to do a virtual card unless you go into the place and say you know you know create the transaction right then and there and the guy has to manually yeah. put it in to his uh, yeah. little point of sale machine correct mm-hmm. or or if they have apple pay google pay it'll be like a bloop yeah. right i mean one of the big advantages also i imagine for these virtual cards is that people who want to make discrete payments let's say you want to mm-hmm. send you're having an affair with a woman you want to send her some roses you can uh, mm-hmm. you know put it on a on a disposable credit card or you want to buy mm-hmm. Um, birth control and you don't want your husband mm-hmm. to know that you're buying birth control, you could, you could do that. Mm-hmm. Um, sure. And there's, uh, or maybe a medication or something like that that you're kind of embarrassed about. I mean, these are mm-hmm. other applications, I imagine. What about some 100%. of the more unusual mm-hmm. things that you've heard? Because you, you were saying earlier that mm-hmm. people yeah. have telling you all sorts of uh, stories about how you, yeah. they're using it in unexpected ways. Can you name one or two examples, please? Well, yes, yeah, so OnlyFans is very popular. Uh, people love using Moon Cards for OnlyFans, uh, and that so that was pretty funny. And and they even on somebody posted about Moon on the OnlyFans subreddit, and they're like, finally a way to privately, you know, sign up on OnlyFans. Right. So so that was pretty fun. Um, right. You know, so so that's you know we haven't seen a whole lot of of things other than that because. Say for example, they were buying birth control. We won't know that. We don't know the details of the purchase. That would we, that would may just show up as like CVS, right? Right. Uh, or Amazon or something like that. We don't know what they're buying exactly. So you know, it's really limited to the the merchant where they're buying, right? That's that's the granularity of detail that we have. Uh, so right. OnlyFans is obvious because it shows up as OnlyFans. Um, you know, I, but yeah, that's really it. In you know, off the top of my head, in terms of um, uh, the types of things that people are buying, I mean, I'm willing to bet that there's a lot we just don't know what those are. Right, and again, what makes it so easy is that you can just create an email address that is going to be your paywithmoon.com email mm-hmm. address, and then you just mm-hmm. need to fund it with crypto, and you don't need Coinbase. You can fund it any mm-hmm. way you want. Um, I did it through the Lightning Network, and then. Uh, yeah. Uh, any kind of advice on how to keep the the fees down for Lightning? By the way. Uh, so so there's a few different things. One, you can connect directly to our node, right? If you you can if you run your own node or if you're using a non custodial wallet that allows you to manage your own channels, and it's a little more technically complex for most people. Um, that that allow you to make a direct connection, and you can set your own fees on that channel. So you can set them to zero. Um, so and that's an option. Um, you know, alternatively, uh, you know, what we do as a company is we open up channels directly to other major node operators. So, for example, we have a channel directly with Blue Wallet and, and a lot of these other folks, Wallet Satoshi. So that uh, so if you're using one of those wallets, uh, since there aren't that many hops, uh, the fees should be very low. Um, I see. Okay. So, yeah, it's a little hard to... You know, I guess it's hard for the average person to realize, you know, what what that looks like and the, and the layout of the network. But most major wallets should be very low fees sending us funds. And one of my listeners can sent me a question about KYC issues and wondering: Is there a way for authorities to trace the you, depending on the coins that you use to kind of trace back the identity of the spender, the real identity of the spender, and then eventually to their wallet. So, for example, let's say I have 100 Bitcoins, you know, and I and I don't want the authorities to know that I have 100 Bitcoins. And then I send a little tiny sliver of that to my moon wallet through Lightning, for example, uh, or directly. Probably that is even more exposure if I go directly through the Bitcoin network. Uh, then... The authorities say, aha, Francis bought this T-shirt and he paid with the moon wallet and then they just backtrack it and they eventually land to my 100 Bitcoin stash and say, hey, tell us about this little, my friend. <laughs> so that's his question. What, what do you have to say, Dan? So I, I think where there's a will, there's a way, right? Um, there's, it would take a lot though, right? So one, um, they'd have to, subpoena the merchant to get the purchase information then they'd have to subpoena us to get 
the card information um, and the payment information. And then say for if it's over the Lightning Network, they'd have to subpoena every node operator in the chain of nodes where the payment was sent through in order to get payment details. Uh, and then they may be able to get the source um, wallet, right? right? And then it, it, would, it would take a lot of work. Bitcoin's taproot affecting the privacy. Yeah, so I think any, any time the Lightning Network gets more private, it makes us more private, right? Um, so so that, that's just kind of like this added benefit. There's nothing specific in taproot that we're uh, necessarily going to tap into and, and utilize. But um, but really, you know, obviously, the more privacy that's built in to the Lightning Network, the better. Um, you know, for us, it's really just a matter of do, did we receive payment? Now, I'm sitting in Senegal, and I would love to, I mean, they don't really accept credit cards in Africa that often. Mm -hmm. uh, there's few countries and regions where they actually do that. But certainly those mm -hmm. who are in Europe are probably listening to this and just salivating, wishing that they could use Moon. Mm -hmm. So what is your plan to roll this out internationally? And what are the obstacles mm -hmm. that you're going to face? Yeah, so... You know, really what we're looking at is, is more the developing world, right? Uh, Latin America, Africa, uh, Southeast Asia, um, uh, Middle East, right? That, that's where there's a lot of demand for something like this, specifically because that's where there are a lot of countries with hyperinflation and currency crises, and, and a lot of people are adopting crypto at a very fast rate, and there are a lot of people that are unbanked. And, uh, you know, a big part of the vision for our company is to be this crypto challenger bank allowing people who are unbanked to live on crypto. Uh, so so that's really what we're looking at. The challenge, one of the biggest challenges you mentioned Europe, is that um, you know if we offer our service in Europe, we have to KYC everybody. That's just the, Europe has, has some of the most strict KYC regulations anywhere. So um, you know, having, having a, a no KYC card would just not really work there. Got it. Okay. Well, that explains a lot because I was kind of scratching my head. Like, why would you want to target Africa since almost nobody uses credit cards? Um, but, but you are right that at the same time you have countries like Zimbabwe or Nigeria who have these devaluating currencies and, and they do have some places where they can buy things with credit cards. Certainly like airline tickets, for example, would be a, an easy example. Yeah, and not just that. It's also people who want to make cross-border transactions, right? So, sure. for example, if you're if you are a millennial in Nigeria, right, the majority of your transactions for online purchases are going to be at overseas merchants. So you're probably going to be shopping on Amazon.com. You want Netflix, Spotify. You want uh, you know any of these streaming services. You want to buy some on Amazon. Generally, if you know you're in Nigeria, you're going to shop on Amazon US or Amazon one of the European Amazons and ship the product down. Okay, for those who are listening to this who are internationally located, uh, I'm going to do a little wink, wink, nudge, nudge here <laughs> regarding what if they just get a VPN and just say that they're in the United States with their VPN and uh, create an email account and then fund it with their Lightning Network, wherever the hell they are. How the hell, you guys wouldn't know, right? Uh, we, we would not necessarily know. No. Right, and so therefore... I mean, that's the solution in a sense. I mean, of course, it's, it's, it's violating probably some important law somewhere. But technically... It's, it does not, actually. It does not. So oh, VPNs, um, uh, Using a VPN know. in order to, you know, let's say I'm in Brazil, but I want to make mm -hmm. it look like I'm in the United States to, so I can use Pay With Moon. That's, that's good to go. Mm -hmm. But by the way, is, is, is yeah, Pay With Moon only mm -hmm. in U.S. dollars? Is that right? It's only in U.S. dollars, and you can only shop at U.S. merchants. Yeah. Got it. Okay. So then in that sense, it doesn't really matter. Okay. 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 But mm -hmm. when I was talking about your rollout to international places is, are you mm -hmm. talking about putting it in their local currency? For example, in South Africa, they have the South African Rand mm -hmm. and that's the name of their currency. Would they mm -hmm. then get, you know, do a lightning payment and then get their credit card funded in Rand? Yeah, it would either be like in Rand or it could be U.S. dollar, but you can then spend it locally, right? So there may be some interesting conversion stuff that has to happen. Uh, okay. So that's something we're still working out, trying to say, okay, how can we get it so that you could shop in, you know, pretty much anywhere in the world? 
Okay, so, but right now, let's say you are in South Africa and they accept dollars at whatever mm. store you're at. Would mm. that be possible or still not because it has to be a U.S.-based still, merchant? Yeah, still has to be U.S.-based. Um, it, it all has to do with the address of the merchant. Okay, so so if they try to run the transaction through, it's just going to get rejected? Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay, got it. All right, well. All these are interesting. So your international plan to roll out, is it something in 2022 you're kind of hoping? And you haven't listed exactly which countries or regions. I know you mentioned several of them, but mm -hmm. which ones your low-hanging fruit are the ones you want to tackle first? Yeah, so it, the international stuff can be very tricky. Um, you know, dealing with different regulations, and there's a lot of different partners that you need to have in order to make that happen. So we're still working through some of that. Uh, we, we haven't said anything you know, and we have no hard dates or deadlines or exact countries we're going to be launching next. Okay, fine. And Ken, last question is about refunds. And because mm -hmm. this is a debit card, the way it works, and that is actually what happened with me when I did my very first payment with Moon, I went ahead mm -hmm. and I bought it. And then the merchant was very sensitive for some strange reason. They said, we just want to verify that you're getting the right monitor that you, that's compatible with your mm. laptop. So can you take pictures, you know, open up your laptop and take pictures of it? I was like, oh, God, what a pain in the ass. I did it. <laughs> and then they said, yeah. you're getting the wrong monitor. You ordered the wrong monitor. It's not compatible with your laptop. Mm -hmm. I was like, well, thank you so much. Mm. And so he said, so we're going to refund your credit card and go and buy the correct one. And I was like, okay, mm -hmm. great. And But that generated a refund. So this brings up the question mm -hmm. for you because... Bitcoin at the time of my purchase was roughly $65,000. And then at mm. the time of the refund, it was probably like $59,000. So let's just say, mm. you know, roughly a 10% decline in the price. Sure. Mm -hmm. Does Pave with Moon eat it? Yeah, so we're not really losing money in that circumstance uh, because we denominate everything in, in dollars in our accounting, right? So, you know, say you had $100 on a card. And, uh, you, you know, it doesn't matter how, you know, you paid that Bitcoin, we convert it to dollars, right? And we're holding dollars. And when you want, uh, you know, your refund, we'll buy that Bitcoin back and send it to you. So it's no loss to us. Um, you know, there's really like a small loss because we're paying the fees to buy and sell Bitcoin. Right. But, you know, like at scale, it, you know, it's, it's negligible. Um, so there's no, there's no loss to us. Um, you know, we don't want people using the platform to like, maximize their returns and things like that. I mean, I, I'd like to think that's a little inconvenient to return products to, you know, get, get a sliver more, sliver more Bitcoin or something. Right. But, uh, but we'll see, we'll have to see what happens. We're in the process of automating the refund process and, and uh, making it a much smoother experience. So, um, you know, and we're constantly learning what users behaviors are. So uh, it, it's going to be interesting to see how it all pans out. Well, Ken, I really admire what you're doing. I'm glad I found you guys, and I'm I'm going to be using PayWithMoon.com in all my purchases from now on that I can get away with, as 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 Thank you. Uh, and and because I I really love the fact that you can do these debit cards things, and and just create them on the fly. It's 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 a fabulous system. I guess the one thing that some people are just going to be resistant on, well, maybe not the one thing, but but one of the things is just. The reward mentality at the fact that, you know, mm -hmm. like, for example, that, I had a dilemma the other day. I was like, OK, well, I had to buy the monitor really quickly because I had to get a replacement monitor. Mm -hmm. And I have an Amazon card that gives me 5% discount when I buy on Amazon. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. why would I use Pay With Moon when I'm going to get a 5% discount using my Amazon card, for example? So that's, I mm -hmm. guess, perhaps yeah. one of your bigger challenges. And I think you addressed it to some mm -hmm. extent, but correct me if I'm wrong, but that... You know, this is designed for people who want to spend your, their crypto first, and that is their priority. They want to have mm -hmm. a they, they want to have a debit card. They have yeah. well, they want a way to send out their crypto to the world and and spend it, mm -hmm. as opposed to somebody who's just looking to get rewards. But is there any way to eventually mm -hmm. satisfy that reward dude out there? And there's plenty of them. Yeah, absolutely. Um, there's a lot of things we're looking at in terms of rewards. We've actually run some rewards in the past, so around holidays. We'll do a 5%, uh, earn 5% in Bitcoin back when you shop. So uh, we love running little promotions like that. We're looking at other opportunities to, to you know, kind of reward our customers and, and do some, you know, just a lot of experimentation, seeing, what, you know, what works, what do people like, what incentivizes spending. 
because uh, you know we do want to really build a community around our product and you know encourage people and reward people for being our customers and that ends this episode of the wander learn podcast where we explore travel technology and transformation if you'd like to see the show notes with links to what we've talked about go to wanderlearn.com and click on this episode if you'd like to connect with me just remember f tap on that's my first initial and my last name f tap on is always my social media username my website is ftapon.com. Do you want to leave me an anonymous voicemail where you can make a comment or ask a question? Then go to speakpipe.com slash ftapon. Furthermore, if you'd like to get rewarded for supporting my projects, then go to patreon.com slash ftapon. That's where you can pick up some remarkable rewards for as little as $2 a month. Now, five quick favors. Number one, subscribe to the WanderLearn podcast. Two, download it. Three, share it four, review it, and five, sign up for my newsletter at wanderlearn.com. Our theme music was composed by Eric Stratman. This is Francis Tapon encouraging you to wander and learn.